In October 1946, John Clarence Woods, an American soldier, had reasons to be joyful. He had enlisted in the Army three years earlier, during a period marked by an otherwise mediocre career. His only notable opportunity arose in 1944 when he volunteered to be the executioner for military-ordered executions. He claimed to have prior experience, stating he had been responsible for carrying out death sentences in Texas and Oklahoma. However, this claim was a blatant falsehood. The last execution in those states had occurred when Woods was only 12 years old. He had never even been close to a gallows or an electric chair, but this was no obstacle to obtaining the position. At that time, the army seemed to care little about one's background. From that moment, John Clarence Woods' trajectory in the army underwent a significant transformation, culminating in his promotion to the rank of sergeant major. In October 1946, Woods faced a dramatic turn in his professional life. He was informed that 12 high-ranking Nazi officers had been sentenced to death at the famous Nuremberg trials, and he would be in charge of executing the sentences. Aware that his role in these events would inscribe him in the pages of history, Woods saw this responsibility not only as a duty but as an opportunity to deliver justice to those who had orchestrated the global conflict. Moved by this sense of retributive justice, Woods planned a sinister surprise for the condemned, designed to ensure that the last moments of these architects of war were marked by exceptional and memorable suffering. Stay tuned to your screen, because in the next few minutes we will unveil all the details about the historic executions at Nuremberg. From November 1945 to October 1946, the International Military Tribunal operated with the mandate to prosecute the leaders of the Third Reich for their war crimes. During this crucial period, harrowing testimonies about the concentration camps and the atrocities committed were presented, revealing the abominable extent of Nazi horror. Faced with the evidence of their own wickedness, the high-ranking Nazis tried to discredit the proofs, claiming ignorance of the true nature of the extermination centers and labeling the evidence as manipulated. However, their weak defenses did not dent the firm tribunal, which remained inexorable against the defeated of World War II. When the sentences were finally pronounced, 12 of the accused were hanged for their crimes against peace and humanity. Among them, however, there were notable exceptions, Hermann Göring, who avoided his fate by committing suicide by ingesting cyanide in his cell under mysterious circumstances, the day before the scheduled executions. Another who escaped his punishment was Martin Bormann, who had died the previous year while trying to flee the Allies and was thus sentenced in absentia. On October 16, 1946, a macabre scene unfolded in the courtyard of the Nuremberg prison. The gallows had been erected to carry out the death sentences of prominent Nazi leaders. Under the supervision of the United States Army, Sergeant John Clarence Woods was appointed as the executioner responsible for adjusting the noose around the necks of the condemned. The planned technique for these executions was the long drop hanging, a meticulous method that required calculating the length of the rope based on the weight of each individual, with the goal of ensuring an instant neck break. However, in a grim twist, Sergeant Woods decided to introduce a punitive variation. He deliberately assigned ropes shorter than necessary. This cruel adjustment ensured that the condemned would not find a quick and merciful death. Instead, they would face prolonged agony, being slowly strangled until they succumbed to asphyxiation. This act was designed as an additional punishment, a final and ruthless retribution for their crimes against humanity. The first to ascend the gallows was Joachim von Ribbentrop, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Third Reich, charged with the atrocities committed under German occupation in Denmark and Vichy France, territories whose puppet governments were under his direct supervision. During the trial, Ribbentrop defended his position by claiming that the real decisions were made by Hitler, not him, and that his role was centered on the pursuit of international peace. However, he never renounced his loyalty to the Fuhrer. He even openly admitted that, despite being aware of the horrors committed, he would obey any order from Hitler if asked. In his final moments, before the hood was placed over his head and the execution proceeded, Ribbentrop took the opportunity to express his last words, but collating with a complex mix of remorse and nationalist loyalty. God protect Germany and take care of my soul. I wish for my country to regain unity and for there to be an understanding between the East and the West for the sake of world peace. With these words, Ribbentrop faced his ultimate fate, leaving a legacy of controversy and guilt. Next, it was the turn of Wilhelm Keitel, the supreme commander of the German armed forces. 
While standing on the platform in front of the judges, Keitel resignedly admitted that he was aware of the illegality of Hitler's orders, but argued that he was compelled to obey due to his oath of loyalty to the Fuhrer. He requested to be shot, an end he considered more dignified for a military officer, but his request was denied. Instead, he was sentenced to death by hanging, a punishment typically reserved for war criminals. His last words resonated in the courtroom with a mix of defiance and plea. I ask Almighty God to have mercy on the Germans. More than two million of our soldiers marched to death for their homeland, and now it is my turn to follow their path. When the time for his execution came, the trapdoor of the gallows proved too small for a man of Keitel's size. As he fell, he violently hit his head, which not only caused severe damage but also prolonged his agony. He died from strangulation, suffering simultaneously from the blood loss from the wound. This tragic outcome added an even darker note to the already grave atmosphere of the Nuremberg trials. After Keitel's execution, it was the turn of Adolf Eichmann, a high-ranking SS officer. In his final moments, Eichmann expressed regret over what he considered inexperienced leadership of the Wehrmacht during the war. Just seven minutes later, the gallows welcomed Alfred Rosenberg, one of the main ideologues of Nazism. When asked if he had any last words, Rosenberg succinctly replied with a simple, no, after which he was executed. After Rosenberg's body was removed, Hans Frank, who had been the general governor of Poland occupied by the Germans, entered the execution chamber. According to those present, Frank was the only one who appeared genuinely remorseful and visibly disturbed by the evidence presented during the trial, including the horrific images of the concentration camps. In fact, Frank had voluntarily handed over his 43 personal diaries to the court, documents that were crucial in establishing his guilt. In his final moments, Frank smiled and extended his gratitude to those who had captured him, thanking them for the humane treatment he had received. He seemed to find some relief in the possibility of atoning for his crimes and, just before his execution, he offered a last prayer. I ask God to have mercy on my soul. Next, the guards escorted Heinrich Himmler, Minister of the Interior and one of the main architects of the Nazi regime, to his final destination. Of all the condemned, Himmler was the most visibly altered, repeatedly stumbling on the steps of the gallows and showing signs of an imminent fate. The last batch of executions included key figures of the Nazi regime, Julius Streicher, Alfred Jodl, and Arthur Seyss in court. These individuals had served, respectively, as the leader of the Nazi party in Franconia, regional chief of Thuringia, and commander of operations for the high command of the armed forces, and deputy governor of occupied Poland. Of these, the execution of Julius Stryker was particularly notable. Stryker, who had not played a military role nor had he directly participated in the planning of the Holocaust or the invasion of other countries, was condemned for his significant ideological influence in spreading anti-Semitism. He led a notoriously violent newspaper that incited hatred and accused Jews of various crimes, which led him to be considered a key accomplice in the genocide. At the moment of his execution, Stryker issued a final challenge with a shout of, Heil Hitler, making sure to be heard by all present. Once on the platform, he continued his rhetoric of hatred towards Jews. When the executioner placed the hood over his face, Stryker used his last moments to issue a final threat. All of you will be hanged by the Bolsheviks. Just before the noose tightened around his neck, he whispered a final goodbye to his wife. Adele, my dear wife. The trapdoor opened, and Stryker hung there, slowly suffocating in a process deliberately extended by Sergeant Woods, kicking in the air until his body finally became still. The bodies of the executed were incinerated and their ashes scattered in a nearby river, a decision made to prevent their graves from becoming pilgrimage sites or altars for future neo-Nazis. This symbolic measure sealed the final fate of some of the most notorious war criminals of the 20th century. Thus concluded some of the most significant executions in history, marking a definitive closure and preventing any form of undue veneration or memorialization of these infamous figures. We have reached the end of our video and would like to pose a crucial question. Do you think Sergeant John Wood should have faced consequences for manipulating the conditions of the executions? We invite you to share your opinions in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel to explore more events and military figures that have marked history. We look forward to your responses and active participation in our community.